travel westward. That uh, went from Jerusalem to Antioch, Antioch to Cyprus and Greece, and then all the whole way over the uh, Middle East to Rome, going westward. And from Rome it went up into Europe. And it uh, got into the mountain people in Europe. And then it was spread to the big cities. And from there, it went to the English Isles. What what God did to the English Isles. Great numbers of people were saved. And great uh, revival broke out. They said that that one revival that hit London, England, at one time, every fifth house in London made and sold rum and liquor. Every fifth house. And a revival broke out. And uh, my, there's great preaching in great churches. And uh, I mean, uh, there was churches built all over London. You go there today and many of them are still there. I was in the Spurgeon's Tabernacle in London. And uh, the building that they've got now is new, but the front, the facade in the front was the one that Spurgeon built. Hitler bombed out the old church, but the facade, the face of it, stood, stood there, and they built behind that the new auditorium, excuse me. And they built a new auditorium. And uh, while we were there, we were taking some tours from the front door of the, of the tabernacle uh, to various places in England. And there was one uh, tourist agent who was a guy in the tour uh, was there. And we said to her, uh, do you know the Lord? Have you ever been born again? You know, that, that's so important to tell people that or ask people that. We ought all of us be doing that all the time. And, uh, you know, you, you'll be surprised. You, you can ask somebody that. If you can't lead them to the Lord yourself, you can give them a track. And there's a track rack out there full of good tracks for whatever it was. And uh, so uh, she said, you mean born again? I said, yes. She said, no, but all my life I wanted to be born again. She said, Billy Graham preached in London, and I heard about born again, but I, I never was able to understand it. I want to be born again. So we sat down there on the steps, our team did, sat down there on the steps and led that woman to the Lord. On the steps of the old Spurgeon's Tabernacle. We were a soul to Christ. You know, uh, the world was wide open and it left London and went to the Welsh Revival. And from the Welsh Revival, it, it came across America. And uh, those revivals in America, like, uh, has not happened since the day of the Pentecost. Uh, in fact, the matter is, uh, there was one young man in New York City, an assistant pastor of the church on Fulton Avenue, Fulton Street, I'm sorry, on Fulton Street, went to the pastor and said, Pastor, I'd like to start a prayer meeting. And uh, he said, well, that, that's a good idea. He said, when should I start it, Pastor? He said, how about Wednesday night? We're not doing anything Wednesday night. That'd be a great time. So he started a prayer meeting on Wednesday night, and it started growing and getting bigger and getting bigger. You know, they didn't have room in the church. So they switched it to an everyday prayer meeting. And they then switched it from the evening to noon. And they said that there was 100,000 businessmen every day in New York City on their knees praying every day at noon. Can you imagine that? Well, how, what would happen to New York City if that would happen today? Well, it happened then. And a revival broke out, and it was called the Great Awakening. And that revival went up the East Coast. And in that Great Awakening, there were preachers preaching to crowds of 100,000 people. Can you imagine that? And uh, great revival, great numbers of people. They say that over a million people got saved as a result of that prayer meeting that young man started. But then, 
it went on, and North Carolina had a great sweeping revival, and there was one preacher down in North Carolina that was preaching, a Baptist preacher down there, that caused the revival to change the Southland into what we call the Bible Belt. One preacher. And uh, revival broke out there. And then it went on, and after the Civil War, Neil Moody and Billy Sunday, those great evangelists, and then after the, the uh, First World War, I should say, there was a, there was a revival. And then after, after that, we had, a, had the Second World War, and God gave us a revival after that. And I was involved in that. And we preached the gospel to the millions in the world. We had more people saved than the Great Awakening. From the, from the last part of the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, even up in the 1970s, we were having, I mean, we couldn't get a tent big enough to hold the crowds. And uh, we were used to hold a family program, our family did, and we would have a thousand kids a night in our tents. And then we have, I would have the adults in another auditorium, the kids in the tent, because we didn't have, we never had buildings big enough for having the kids and the adults. adults. And so we had great meetings today, but they're not for anything. And then the revival spread then across the Pacific. And uh, they're saying now that China may be in a few years the largest Christian nation in the world. Can you imagine that? China. And that's all underground. It's all secret in there. And, that, and, and the Philippines. You, you can't believe the revival in the Philippines. We go to the Philippines and I'll preach sometimes, or used to. I don't know if I can do it again. But uh, I used to preach five, six times a day in the Philippines. We would go to we'd go to big colleges, and they bring the college kids into uh, an auditorium. We would preach for two hours and sing and testify. And then sometimes every one of those young people would say they wanted to be born again. And then we take them out and bring another two thousand in, and we do that again. I mean. Revival is in the Philippines right now in China. It's spreading to India. And we even believe it's going to hit Pakistan. And we get any freedom in the Muslim world and present to them a God that loves them and wants to save them, we'll have a revival like we've never seen before. Because they don't have a God like that. And uh, we're hoping that the revival continues to go westward. And uh, we're looking forward to that. In fact, the matter is, in Bible prophecy, you don't find the Arabs mentioned in any of the wars in Bible prophecy. It mentions the Muslim nations, such as our Iran, which is uh, old Persia, northern Africa. It speaks about those uh, uh, those African Muslims in the southern part of the, the northern part of Africa, then they call them Ethiopians, and it talks about it talks about uh, Turkey, Togarm, and Russia, and these nations that are going to fight against Israel. There's no mention of the Arabs there, so we're hoping, you know, the Arabs are descendants of Abraham. The Iranians are not. They're Persians. They speak a language called Farsi. They don't even speak Arabic. They're not Arabs. The Arab nations are Jordan, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, and uh, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. All those are Arabs. They're descendants of Abraham uh, through his children. And so, we're hoping that revival will break out among the Arabs. I believe it's going to. And you know what I think? Now, this is my own opinion, and I'm going to preach out of Zechariah chapter 14 tonight, if you want to turn there. It's my opinion that there's going to be a revival 
in Jerusalem. Wouldn't that be good? It started there. Yes. It went westward. Yes. It's going to melt the earth. Yes. And come back to Jerusalem. Amen. But now what I want to do the rest of my life, whatever that is, I want to get the gospel to that Middle East. I've already preached in Jordan and Israel and Iran, or Iraq. I've preached in Egypt and uh, we've been in some of those African countries preaching. But I, I, I'm looking forward to uh, doing something good for God in Israel and Jordan again. We started Bible college in Jordan that we were training refugees from Iraq that were Christians, teaching them and training them. And now some of those that we taught and trained are in other parts of the world preaching the gospel in Arabic, in Australia, in Canada, and in Europe. Now we've not done that without casualties. Uh, the man that I worked with in London who was preaching the gospel in Arabic in the streets uh, and we're giving out Bibles there. Where I got the Bibles from the Trin Trinitarian Bible Society in London. King James Bible, the uh, Trinitarian Bible Society, probably is one of the biggest in the world, and that's strictly King James. <coughs> and uh, that uh, that missionary that I worked with in in London, he was an Arab himself, who came from uh, Morocco. And he was raised, his uh, childhood language was Arabic. And so he was preaching in the streets and giving out Bibles. And we were giving out Bibles there. And I preached a lot in the streets of London. And uh, have had some good results from it. And uh, this man who, with whom I was working, I will not mention his name, but uh, he, uh, for fear, that there might be some reprisals, you know. Uh, all of this stuff that we say on the, is recorded right in the, the government by our government over our cell phones. I don't know if you know that or not, but it is. And uh, I know two of the biggest computers in the world in Tennessee where they're run by preacher friends of mine for the government. They're, they're uh, employed by the government to run them. But anyhow, I won't get into that. But uh, <clears throat> he was giving out the gospel in London, and one day he was surrounded by Muslims. One of them said to him, Are you a Christian? Which means, in their language, it means, Is your background Christian? Are your forefathers? Your father and mother, and your grandfathers and all, grandmother, were they all Christians? And he said, No. I'm a Sunni convert, and he shouldn't have said that. He shouldn't have answered that. Because in the Quran, it says that anybody that converts out of Islam should be killed, should be slain. And they began to kick him, and they kicked him down. And then they proceeded to kick him in his ribs and his head. They kicked his head like he would a soccer ball. Until somebody said some of his brains were on the sidewalk. The police finally came and hauled him off to the hospital and they saved his life. But he was so impaired that we could never work again, together again. I lost contact with him. I don't know how that happened. I even sent an English preacher to find him. I couldn't, I couldn't rescue him. And that's, uh, that's what has happened in much of the world. But you know what? I believe the gospel is building the world again. I think we're going to see it happen in, in uh, an open door in some of these countries where we've never been before. And I, I don't know what your political persuasion is. I don't care. It won't make me any difference. But what has happened with the president uh, the, the present president is that that has helped us get into some of these countries where we never was able to get in before. And so in that case, it's been a good thing for the 
gospel. Amen. And so we're able to do that. We're building churches in Arab nations right now and working with them. Uh, you, you can't believe the success of some of these things that have happened and what God is doing there. We had uh, two imams in Pakistan get saved. And they were going to be killed uh, by the uh, Muslims. But they were able to flee to Bangladesh, who was also a Muslim nation. Now, I won't get into all of that, but they're now preaching the gospel. What a victory that is for Jesus Christ. And so, uh, if we're just saying the gospel is going. Now, what's going to happen in the future, okay? Is it Zechariah chapter 14? It's a major uh, prophecy of these last days. I hope that you get acquainted with this chapter. Because it tells us what's going to happen right here in the near future. This is what it says in 